The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, an extended conversation with Stanley Greenberg on his new book, R.I.P. G.O.P., How the New America is Dooming the Republicans. Plus, Bill Press talks with mental health experts about why they fear the president is a danger to the nation. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Progressive Democrats are not only fighting to get Donald Trump out of the White House, but for a new alignment of politics in America that will realize a progressive agenda on everything from jobs and immigration to health care and the climate. Polster and author Stanley Greenberg says the nation is ready to respond and Republicans are set up for a shattering defeat. And we say hello to Stanley B. Greenberg, founding partner of Greenberg Research and Democracy Corps and author of America Ascendant, a revolutionary nation's path to addressing its deepest problems and leading the 21st century. His most recent book is R.I.P. G.O.P., How the New America is Dooming the Republicans. Stan Greenberg, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to speak to your audience. And our pleasure to have you with us. And I'll start off by saying congratulations on the new book. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm, it, it was uh, a labor of love or intense love. I mean, I think so many people came off of the Women's March determined to, to do something. Uh, for me, it was the, this book and writing this book, you know, every, every, every morning. Uh, but, it all, but it also made me feel so strongly about America because everything Trump did produced a reaction that has, you know, created uh, this book and this, uh, I think, this transformative moment. And uh, let's see whether we can produce it together. Indeed. And what you are writing about is an America that is changing with huge demographic shifts along the lines of age, ethnicity, Mm. where we live and where we come from. And that will be a problem for today's Republican Party. So what Mm. are some of the most significant ways this will change politics as usual for the Republicans? You know, the uh, look, the starting point is, you know, they are in the midst of a accelerating battle, you know, against the new America, uh, the new America that is, you know, diverse, immigrant, foreign born, uh, made up of uh, you have unmarried, single people, uh, working women, independent women, uh, you know, ascendant uh, over the uh, male br- uh, breadwinner roles. And so a very different America, but they are, they have fought this battle against this new America, which is also now newly conscious of of it, of what it believes. Um, but it's fought the battle in such a way that in our most recent research, it's driven away, <clears throat> driven away the secular conservatives. It's driven away the moderate women, moderate Republican women, and has alienated independents. Uh, so you, like, you have, to, you know, it almost has to play this out. You know, I, I, I keep thinking maybe Trump will pause, you know, maybe I'll reach out. But he, you know, but winning over the Tea Party and evangelical was how he, you know, got the nomination. It's how he got elected, and uh, and he feels he has he has to play it out. So I don't think I think it's faded in terms of what they are going to do uh, in two thousand, you know, twenty. Uh, then the question becomes, what happens afterwards? You know, what happens afterwards? It, the the moderate Republicans, you know, the social liberal Republicans are not there anymore. Uh, I mean, I thought, if you look at my last book, I actually thought the fight would be between the social liberals, you know, the moderate social liberals, um, you know, and the uh, evangelicals. 
Now, I thought Cruz would be the nominee. <laughs> and so we've, <laughs> we've gone a different course. But in the process, Trump has, you know, has driven away those voters that could make the, you know, the party you know, viable. Um, so the, they're going you know, to have to go through, I think, a number of elections. You know, we went through many. <clears throat> Think about what happened after Reagan, the defeat in 1980, the, you know, the landslide in 1984. You know, we had big internal fights. You know, it took us, you know, three or four elections, you know, before we had a presidential candidate, you know, that could unite and break through and win. And I think they're going to go through that process. Well, and your book describes a Republican Party essentially at war with America itself. What are some of the issues that define the front lines of this battle? Yeah. Look, this, uh, this has become, you know, a battle over demography uh, and immigration. It was more complicated than that. But, you know, but the, if you look at, at the team that, you know, that surrounds Trump at the White House, uh, it comes almost, you know, entirely from California. You know, Steve Miller is from uh, from there. Uh, they are, you know, very much allied with Bannon and Breitbart, Breitbart News, and those host of uh, people and and funders, Mercer, others that were based in California. They were the first to fight what they thought was the demographic problem, um, and they ended up dooming the Republican Party in you know in California. But we now have the California Republican Party running the Republican Party nationally, you know, and so every they and every time they lose, it just confirms for them uh, it's the immigrants, it's the illegal immigrants who are you know who are voting that are producing producing this outcome, and so they are they have this uh, inescapable battle um, that they uh, that they can't get out of. Well, and this political moment uh, for the Republican stand is one that has really been building over time. How did the Trump version of politics get solidified even before he was a political player? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the what I learned in writing this book was that the Republican Party has actually been engaged in about a, about a half century battle against against the modernization of the country. You know, and it, be, and it began with civil rights. It also then went to, you know, what happened with abortion and contraception. And then it built uh, with, you know, with immigration. You know, all of which have come together <clears throat> to put this party at war, you know, with this new America. I mean, that's what was, you know, what I learned the most, you know, in going through this history. And I think a lot of people reading the book you know, this will look quite new. You know, you had the civil rights, the, the civil rights laws that were passed on, under Lyndon Johnson. Uh, they were passed with bipartisan support. Both parties were split on, you know, on civil rights. But once the civil rights laws were passed, the Democrat, the Democratic leadership, Democratic Party, its presidential candidates embraced them you know, and championed them and sought to protect them. But from the very beginning, the Republican presidential candidate, the Republican presidential candidates, you know, fought the implementation of the civil rights laws, affirmative action, and so they became a party, you know, of the deep South and South and more rural, and rural America. Then they had the abortion decision of the Supreme Court. Again, you know, the Democratic Party was divided, but we accepted the decision. And by you know Jimmy Car by the time of Jimmy Carter, <clears throat> we were accepting as a party um, that this is a pro-choice country. There's a right to uh, to abortion, uh, but they have made a constitutional amendment on abortion center stage and are still fighting contraception right now. Uh, then you had immigration. Both parties passed you know major legislation, includes Ronald Reagan, George Bush, the father. Uh, major legislation on immigration that both granted, uh, legalized, you know, many undocumented, but then also expanded immigration that happened under both parties. But then in the, in the 1980s and with Newt Gingrich in the 90s, um, the party fought immigration and immigration became the, the, you know, defining battle. And in fact, if you go to 2016, Trump, it's immigration. 
that has a, has a strongest correlation with voting for Republicans, being hostile to immigrants, particularly Mexican Americans. Yeah. So they, you know, they they've been able to succeed because they've had a base in the South um, and and Appalachia. When they moved to abortion, they actually expanded into rural areas across the country. But their base was evangelical and rural uh, and southern, and that enabled them in a federal system to be electorally successful, even though they were fighting the you know the trend. But that has all come back to, to haunt them, and they because these these trends are all accelerating, um, and only a like kind of a life and death battle against these trends can possibly pause it, uh, and that's why they're getting such a negative reaction against them now. What's your understanding of why the Republicans chose this path? Was it a misguided sense of political expediency or something more? Well, the if you, look if you if you go back to you know to what you know what happened to the parties, you know in the nineteen sixties, Lyndon you know Lyndon Johnson said then you know when I signed the civil rights laws, I've just you know flipped uh, the, the South. Uh, from the Democratic Party, maybe we begin also to, to have the support of you know blacks, African Americans in this new period. Uh, but he did, you know, but he it, the South did flip. It was you know it was a fundamental change in the country for racial equality to become accepted. This was a slave country um, that had created segregation over near over near century, and there was such a, there was such a political advantage in being the party of white people. I don't want to, it's not subtle, but if you if you take from Richard Nixon on the war on 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 being tough on crime to Ronald Reagan, you know, doing his speech after his announcement uh, in Mississippi, you know, where the kids uh, little kids were uh, died at the at church. I mean, they were they were sending a signal during that whole formative period that they are a party that white people you know could trust. Um, to cover for them and look out for their interests. And obviously Donald Trump has taken that to a, to a fairly well. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This Social Security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Stan Greenberg, author of R.I.P. GOP, How the New America is Dooming the Republicans. Coming up next, we continue the conversation. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Great news, people. We have a new ally in our historic battle against corporate plutocracy, corporate plutocrats. Yes, we've now been joined by the CEOs of J.P. Morgan Chase, Walmart, Amazon, and nearly 200 other giant corporations. They're members of the Business Roundtable, the chief lobbying front for America's biggest corporations, and they've declared their solidarity with all of us by issuing a grand declaration titled Statement on the Purpose of a Corporation. For 50 years, that purpose has been ruthlessly clear. 
maximize their investors' profits, no matter who or what they have to run over. But now, the barons of big business are putting on a softer face, proclaiming that their fundamental commitment is not merely to serve shareholder greed, but also to benefit workers, reduce inequality, protect the environment, etc. It's corporate kumbaya, y'all. Solidarity forever. Alex Gorski, CEO of Johnson & Johnson, was designated to write the Roundtable's new Declaration of Concern for the Common People. He later expressed an historic sense of pride in the task. There were times when I felt like Thomas Jefferson, Gorski gushed. But wait, this is the guy who presided over Johnson & Johnson's profiteering role in spreading deadly opioids throughout America. An Oklahoma jury just assessed a half-billion-dollar fine on his corporation for foisting the opioid horror on the common people he now professes to love. This is Jim Hightower saying, So forgive me for not believing for a moment that there's one iota of sincerity in this sudden assertion of egalitarian sentiment by the soulless organizers of today's corporate plunder. They're still going to plunder your unions, paychecks, jobs, health, environment, and overall well-being. The only difference is that they now want you to think that they, they feel badly about it. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. We were speaking with Stan Greenberg, founding partner of Greenberg Research and Democracy Corps, and also his uh, author of a, a few different books, his most recent, R.I.P. GOP, How the New America is Dooming the Republicans. Stan, the election of Donald Trump produced an enormous reaction and pushback and continues to do so. What does this tell us who we are as a nation that, in your words, makes us exceptional? I actually do. Look, I actually do think we are exceptional. And, and, we, we, and we but we we second guess that after Trump won, because when Trump won, we really asked ourselves and I asked myself, you know, what do Americans believe? How, how could we have elected, um, you know, Donald Trump, given how explicitly racist and anti-immigrant uh, he, uh, he was in the campaign he ran, and yet he uh, was able to win enough electoral college votes to uh, become, you know, become president. And a, a, a lot of people were, you know, were struggled with this. You know, we, when we did focus groups um, after the election, we discovered we could not put Clinton voters and Trump voters in the, in the same room uh, because, one, they fought, but also the, the Clinton voters had become abusive. I mean, they, could, they couldn't believe the, the, uh, you know, the country had elected uh, Trump. They were totally disrespectful of the, you know, the Trump voter. We had the moderator had to protect them uh, because the, the Clinton voters were so rude. I mean, we thought they should apologize, uh, but it was, but it reflected the moment. They, you know, their families were divided. I mean, even, you know, it was such a big generational change, you know, that so many of these Trump voters would talk about their kids, you know, not being, not talking to them, you know, being uh, estranged as, as a result sure. of this uh, election. And so the, it really shook up the country and to get clarity on what, on what we believe. It's actually one. It's one of the. It's one of the things I was most reassured about, you know, in uh, in this book. But it's the thing that people have had the most trouble uh, believing, which is the fact that America has become more pro-immigration every day that Trump has been in office. And then, in fact, if we look at the 2018 midterm elections, he sent the you know 5,000 troops to the border. Uh, he, 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 he railed about the caravan that was bringing, you know, undocumented immigrants who were protecting terrorists into the country. They did uh, ads um, that uh, had undocumented immigrants, uh, you know, murdering, uh, you know, Americans. They, I mean, they ran that campaign in 2018 and they, lo they lost in a, in a historic turnout election 
with a, a margin you know, much bigger than anything Barack Obama ever achieved, including 2008. Um, and also, when we ask the question, you know, does immigration help or, be, uh, help or hurt the country, by about a 20-point margin, double the margin, people said it benefited. So even though we just had an, elect, uh, an election, a high it turned out intense election, the country sided with immigration in that election, in an election in which Democrats won in a landslide. And we, in our polls, we've also shown since that election further movement in favor of immigration. We're now at about two-thirds who think immigration benefits the country. There's only 26 percent, a quarter of the country, who thinks like Donald Trump that immigration uh, hurts uh, jobs, you know, education uh, and health care. And so he's very marginalized. But I don't think people will believe it until they see him lose. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I just people just, and you know, I'm I'm thankful actually that they're going to keep their you know their foot on the pedal. People are engaged. They want this done and uh, and, and finished. And and the Republican Party that has fostered him um, defeated. Uh, but in fact, one of the most reassur- one of the most reassuring things about what's happened is how clear Americans have become that they, we are an immigrant country. That's our history. And we welcome immigration. They want it legal. They want it managed, but they, you know, but they, uh, but we're an immigrant country, diverse country, multicultural country. Um, and, but it will take the is shattering defeat for the elites and for all of us to believe it. Absolutely. Now, another thing your book outlines, um, it's some of the fractures that are beginning to appear in the Republican stronghold. What should we be paying closest attention to? The, well, the, I would, look, I would, we focused a lot in the 2018 election. And, and it really did happen. We kept, we kept saying, Yes, he does have a high appro- overall approval rating, but it w- but it was not true uh, in terms of strong approval. If you look at secular conservatives and if you look at moderates, um, and right now I think with moderates we have only about thirty one percent give him strong you know approval. You know, so there are you know there are Republicans who are moving away you know from uh, from Trump are not enthusiastic, um, and the. Um, they were in in the eighteen a significant number shifted to the Democrats, um, but I'm but I'm not sure that's where the focus will be now. I think the focus now is is what's going to happen to the white working class. The they began to move um, in eighteen. Um, the big the biggest shifts actually were in the rural areas and white working class men and women, and, and we now in our polls have white working class women you know, with less than a, you know, in single digit lead uh, for Trump. And that would be, that would be, that would shake the world if that happened. You know, and those, those women are, you know, those, that's, or I think the real target is um, because they voted for him. This is not his base voters. They voted for him, you know, thinking he really was going to deliver health care that was affordable, that he was going to drain the swamp, that he really would not, for, you know, forget the working people. And they don't think that's what's happened. They think it's good, it's corrupt as can be. He's enriching himself. Uh, he's divisive and can't get anything done. He's mostly for men, not women. And the um, and so I think that's where our target of opportunity will be, and that will open up a lot of states, and particularly to make sure we win the Senate. It's not acceptable if we don't win the Senate in 2020. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I find it interesting that you know the Republicans could make some choices that would allow it to stave off its demise, the, the, the party in general. But you argue mm-hmm. it is unlikely to do so. Why is the party willing to deny what seems to be staring it right in the face? You know, I, you know, I was, look, it, may, it just may be that Trump is not that smart, <laughs> you know, in the, or, <laughs> or not that, <laughs> or not that you know, effective as a, as a strategist, you know, politically, you know, he had a, you know, a Johnny one note strategy to get the nomination. No one thought he would get it. His strategy 
was focused right on the Tea Party. So if you look at when he, when he came down the escalator, talking about the Mexicans and, and you know their worst people, you know murderers and rapists, he built up support with the Tea Party bloc, which was the most energetic and most conservative part of the Republican you know party. But he did not mention abortion. He talked you know only about immigration. And he focused only on the Tea Party. And he built up that base. Cruz, you know, Cruz thought that would be, Rubio thought maybe that would be their base, but he immediately locked them up. And then he created this uh, alliance uh, with Pence and the evangelicals, and that's what gave him a majority of the Republican voters. Um, and he has tried to deliver for the Tea Party and evangelicals. You can check the box on the issues they care most about, whether it's guns. And for Tea Party, you know, guns are the issue they care most about. They are most pro NRA. It would be so easy for him to make a shift on background, but he can't do it. So whenever I think maybe he'll move, I think he just he has a strategy that's based on his coalition, you know, of you know of those two parts of his coalition. They got him here. They'll protect him if, if there's impeachment. Uh, they'll protect him after he comes out of office. Uh, but he's he's been unwilling either consolidate the full range of Republicans and has been unwilling to reach independence. Uh, and he might well have done it. You know, after 2018, you easily could have imagined him saying, "All right, here's the deal. I can do an immigration. Here's the infrastructure bill that I'll you know I'll do. Uh, here's the trade agreement." You know, on NAFTA that I know you want to support, he could have done those three things after the 2018 election. And I just think he could not, he didn't have the imagination to think beyond his base strategy. Yeah. All right, before we let you go, let's turn to Democrats. What do they need to do Mm -hmm. to not just be the quote unquote least worst choice, but something Mm -hmm. that is actually meaningful and inspiring to our new America? Yeah. I, I think that's also one of the, I think, comes out very strongly in the book. I have a chapter in the book on, you know, wh- how did the Democrats, you know, let Donald Trump win? And part of that was not having a vision uh, for change in the country. Our voters are desperate for change. But the change they want is not just to put away, you know, Donald Trump. They are, you know, they are angry at the corruption that is built up uh, in Washington from the secret money uh, that has it clouded the government, uh, you know, from the 2010 uh, uh, Tea Party wave forward. That's when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of dark money. Um, they are angry that the that the health care has been, you know, turned into a mess. Um, that the one effort at the um, having a serious health care system they've tried to destroy. They are angry that they have tried to make government impotent. You know, whenever there's a problem, whether it is stagnant wages, inequality, climate change, the assault weapons slaughter that's happening, the response is that, no, there's nothing government can do. And that's been building up over a decade. And so I think you're going to find that, you know, our you know, our voters are going to respond to candidates that are very robust in how much they want to use government. They want they want activist government in area of their area. There's been a surge overall, you know, like by 20 points, the highest level that we've seen on people uh, on government wanting to do more. Um, but you'll find three quarters, two thirds, three quarters of Democrats that are for any area, you know, that you can think of, um, tackling the problem. Um, and so they're impatient for that to happen. I think you'll see candidates across the board, across the ideological spectrum, talking about expansive government and things addressing problems. Um, that's what our people are looking for. Okay. His most recent book, R.I.P. GOP, How the New America is Dooming the Republicans. Stanley B. Greenberg, founding partner of Greenberg Research and Democracy Corps, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Stan, a pleasure speaking with you today. We look forward to having you back again with us soon. Great. Thank you.
You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now, Bill Press on Donald Trump's state of mind and why mental health experts are taking an unusual public stand to warn the public. Dr. Lee, Dr. Post, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to ask you first, so it was um, a couple of years ago uh, that, uh, Dr. Lee, you put together a group of uh, mental health professionals, uh, published uh, through St. Martin's Press, a book called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, where you collectively um, issued a pretty strong warning about the mental instability of the 45th president of the United States. That This book came out two years ago. Are you still worried, and should Americans be worried? Yes. In fact, we have been impressed at how the events have unfolded exactly as we predicted and according to the timeline we estimated. we The book came about because uh, we were talking amongst ourselves and realized that we were all concerned. There was a general medical consensus that the president, Donald Trump, in the pre- office of the presidency would become dangerous. Um, and we had to deliberate over the ethics of whether we should uh, refrain from commenting on a public figure, which we, of course, we need to be careful about, versus the public interest of uh, we also, as psychiatrists, have a duty to society as well as to patients. And so whether our duty to society obligated us to issue a warning, to inform the public, mainly educate the public of what we were seeing. And we decided overwhelmingly for educating. And that is how we came out with the book. So, Dr. Post, uh, it's been two and a half years. Have Donald Trump's actions as president uh, confirmed your fears? Very much, uh, indeed. I'm rather gravely concerned in terms of where things are going with this man. He is someone who I think poses great danger to American society. The tension you spoke about, Abendi, between the duty to educate, the the duties to convey psychiatric expertise to American society, in contrast to the prohibition on making diagnoses at a distance, I don't think it's even close. To me, there's a, a major ethical obligation for psychiatrists to share their expertise about this man. But, but wouldn't a lot of people say, I and mean, a lot of uh, mental, mental health professionals or medical professionals say, that, you, that psychiatrists ought to stay out of politics? This is not about politics. It has nothing to do with politics. It just happens to be in the political sphere. But it is a response to the medical need that we see. And we are simply applying standard criteria for assessing dangerousness. It's harm to society and public health that we're concerned about, not about politics. So what is the trigger that would prompt you to speak out rather than uh, hold your tongue privately? Well, there's a broad pattern of uh, positions and actions he's taken, which are really quite dangerous and uh, uh, concerning. Uh, Dropping out of the uh, Paris Accord, dropping out of the Iran Accord. Now I see sacrificing money from childcare in order to to, uh, have the Great Wall of Trump. Uh, There's 
one after another of these. It's it's too numerous to count. Well, the word you use is is interesting to me. Danger. Is that the trigger when you see a yes. public danger that you feel you have an obligation to warn the public about? Some ethicists would argue that any kind of uh, benefit to society would trigger a uh, comment, even on a public figure. But I hold a more rigorous standard because when we're speaking in public, I do agree that we have to be cautious. And I tend to believe that diagnosing is not possible or not complete because we don't have the whole uh, set of medical records. But there's plenty of things that we can comment on. And uh, diagnosing is not necessary. Diagnosing is for treating the, the public figure's personal mental health. And we're not, uh, the public figure is not our patient. We are not concerned about that. What we are concerned about is society, is its safety and health. And when there are danger signs, when there is, uh, when there are signs that it puts the public at risk, especially existential risk, then that is certainly a trigger. And that's consistent with all our medical uh, guidelines. And so what you're saying is that Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, uh, is a danger yes. to the American people. Yes. Uh, and he, is, he warned us, right, that he might be. Yes, yes. In fact, dangerous individuals often tell us what they are willing to do, can do, and might dare to do. And it's important to hear those words, not to simply go to a default of what we think is normal presidential be, uh, expectation, but rather to see the individual for what they are presenting themselves to be. Uh, I was looking uh, at one, page 172 in the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, um, where one of your authors says, the issue that we are raising uh, Dr. Post, let me ask you if you agree with this. The issue that we are raising is not whether Donald Trump is mentally ill. It is whether he is dangerous. Absolutely. And one without being mentally ill. And I don't see President Trump as being mentally ill. But the aspects of his personality and character are particularly uh, troubling. To, to put this in a, in, a, in a broader sense, I testified twice and you interviewed me indeed about Saddam Hussein, low these many years ago. And I testified before Congress twice. And afterwards, the president of the Institute of Peace said this was a service of the highest order to the American populace. And I was feeling pretty good about that. And the next day, I got a call from the chairman of the Commission on Psychiatry and foreign affairs. And I sat in that commission too, and he said, Jerry, I wanted to speak to you about your profile of Saddam Hussein. And I said, uh, fe feeling puffed up, my back ready to be batted. Yeah. I said, sure. He said, we have reason to believe you violated the canons of ethics of the American Psychiatric Association. And I said, how is that, pray tell? And uh, he said, uh, well, I presume you didn't interview uh, Saddam or have his permission. And I said, have you, have you read it? Uh, uh, and he said, well, no. I said, well, maybe you should. And, then, and I then proceeded also to elaborate what you were speaking about earlier, Bandy, that there was a duty to warn in psychiatry. And one breaks psychiatric confidentiality when danger is, is present, and that uh, sort of was the end of that. But but there's something kind of bizarre about, on the one hand, being told that we made a service of the highest yeah. order for the American populace, and on the other hand, uh, it's unethical. Well, this gets to, uh, without your colleague mentioning it, perhaps, the famous Goldwater Rule, which was adopted by the American Psychiatric Association in 1973, I believe, uh, after some people questioned the mental balance of uh, Barry Goldwater when he was running for president, uh, which I, 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 I'm not a psychiatrist, but I, as I understand, basically says 
you do not opine about the mental health of anyone unless you have personally examined that person and have that person's permission. Is that rule, the paramount rule, is it still in place and are you violating it? Well, I would actually like to clarify uh, because Please. I'm a staunch supporter of the Goldwater rule and it is a reasonable rule, but only in the context of our responsibility to society, because we do not have a primary responsibility to a public figure, but we do to society and to patients. And the Goldwater Rule actually states this. Uh, psychiatrists have a responsibility to society as well as to patients. And we, have, uh, we are expected to participate in activities that improve the community and better public health. So, if we are asked about a public figure, we should educate the public in general terms, just not diagnose, unless we've examined them and gotten consent from them. Now, a diagnosis, which can sometimes be called a professional opinion, that's different from just any opinion of a professional, um, is, uh, uh, is a very specific activity that we do not engage in all the time. Uh, diagnosis is only a fraction of what psychiatrists do. In fact, we, uh, we diagnose maybe, you know, just a fraction of the time with patients, but we assess dangerousness every single clinical visit and every moment that we are even out in public because we have a duty to society. And when there is danger, we even break the sacrosanct principle of patient confidentiality, now, which is in the law also. Um, so with a public figure with whom we don't even have an obligation to confidentiality, and there is no law because that would actually be against the law um, to be restricted in speech in that way regarding a public figure, uh, that that the American Psychiatric Association would place that small portion of the Goldwater Rule, the prohibition, above every other medical principle is just illogical. And I mm -hmm. actually call it politically motivated because it's based on politics, the political situation alone. It goes against science. It even goes against our practices of diagnosis these days. Research now shows that whether or not you have a personal interview um, does not necessarily uh, hold the primary um, place in diagnosing, and, and our diagnosing practices have changed drastically since 1980. By the way, uh, Dr. Oppose and, and Dr. Lee, it's not like Donald Trump um, hides his light under a bushel either. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, we see him a lot on television. He tweets hundreds of times a day, right? You have lots of evidence. Let me... Um edit one of your words when Please. you talked about the Goldwater Rule. It isn't the Goldwater Rule. A, a colleague of mine at George uh, Washington, Alan Dyer, was on the original committee, ethics committee, mm -hmm. and it was originally an ethical principle. Mm -hmm. A principle is a guideline. It's not a thou shalt not. And having spent my career doing personality profiles of world leaders and having being considered the founding father of the uh, discipline of profiling. I certainly don't believe my entire career has been an exercise of thou shalt not right. and, and has been forbidden. Do you believe that Donald, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you believe that Donald Trump presents such a public danger that you have, a, as professionals, a moral duty to speak out and warn the American people? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I know this is not politically correct, but is he crazy? No. I would say I, we don't know. That is the part that is about diagnosis. He's abnormal, certainly. He's impaired. But whether or not he meets a diagnosis, is uh, that is the part that depends on the full medical information. Whether or not it involves a personal interview, it depends on the diagnosis. So, so what are the signs... Uh, of abnormal behavior, let's say, uh, or unstable behavior that you see. We hear uh, narcissism. I see him as the quintessential narcissist. And we've had 
example after example of the traits of narcissism, which he demonstrates. Now, it should be noted, it is not unusual to have political figures having significant <laughs> narcissism. Right. Indeed, the first sentence of my book, Dangerous Charisma, the political psychology of uh, Donald Trump and his followers. And I want you to note that, and his followers. This, this is a book of yours, which will be out in November. But w what is really striking, the issue of empathy, one of the major traits of a narcissistic personality is he's so wrapped up in himself, so in love with himself, he almost doesn't have the emotional energy to care for other people. And the issues, for example, the dying McCain, who was a, a political leader who I greatly admired, even though there were almost all policy differences between us. But I was always struck by his courage and his, and his principles. And the, the manner in which President Trump really cast doubt upon his, his character, was not able to convey empathy for his, his dying and mocked him. It was just, just dreadful. Or Khan, the, uh, uh, the speaker at the... Uh, the Democratic Convention. Here's a gold star father right. who was mocked again by President Trump of, of something uh, that I was particularly struck by. The New York Times reporter uh, who had a congenital spastic mm -hmm. uh, condition and Trump mocked him going like this with his, with his uh, just, just, so, so there seems to be no capacity for. You might, uh, might add uh, the people of Puerto Rico to that, to that list uh, as well. After, uh, after Hurricane Maria, in fact, continuing to this day, um, Dr. Lee, in the book, uh, in terms of danger signs, um, a couple of your um, colleagues use as their number one example the nuclear trigger, yes. that this is a man uh, as unstable as he is, who is got it, who has his finger on the nuclear button, which kind of raises some alarms, or you believe it should. Absolutely. That has been our primary concern and our overriding concern, just because the risk is just um, it's so astronomical that it overrides all other um, refutations, if you will. Um, so when we measure danger, if I can just interrupt you for a second, I just wanted to point out that the title of your, the chapter in your book is, I think it sums it up. He's got the world in his hands and his finger on the trigger. Yes. Whoa. That's right. Ahead, We're that. in uh, great nuclear risk as it is, uh, having the arsenal to be able to destroy the earth, destroy humanity and many other species many times over. Um, and it's always on hair trigger alert. And in, a, in addition to a bunch of other uh, error proneness, um, it's, it's dependent on one person's decision making without any checks, without any um, uh, without any um, ability to verify whether or not the president's judgment is intact. There's only a verification process of whether or not he made an order. And so within minutes, uh, he could launch nuclear weapons. And particularly with his personality structure, he would be attracted to nuclear weapons. Um, his, his destructiveness in general, his violence proneness, the way he, his verbal aggression, <coughs> his, his boasting about sexual assaults, his incitement of violence... Um, among his supporters, his taunting other nuclear powers, and his now policies that make nuclear war simply more feasible, all of these things point to exactly what we have been fearing, that, and, and now renewed nuclear arms race globally uh, are a signs of realization of what we've been fearing. Uh, and you say that pretty clearly again, in the book, collectively with our co-authors, we warn that anyone 
as mentally unstable as Mr. Trump simply should not be entrusted with the life and death powers of the presidency. Yes, exactly. That sums it up. So, Dr. Post, in terms of profiles of world leaders, I don't know whether you ever uh, did a profile of or published a profile about President Richard Nixon, but I'm reminded of Nixon in this conversation uh, because he was so considered so unstable at the end of his presidency that Defense Secretary James Schlesinger uh, actually told people at the Pentagon, if the president orders a nuclear strike, don't do it. Correct. And uh, indeed, we should be very concerned about President Trump as an individual being entrusted with the nuclear but it's a, it's a very uh, alarming uh, situation to broaden the concern what happens with say uh, Kim Jong Un and President Trump at one point had a love fest between them uh, but now are by no means in in that place but it's it's very concerning that this is not a real estate deal and some of the same lessons he's taken from his career in real estate uh, seem to be applied uncritically to the negotiations with this dangerous adversary. Bill Press talking with psychiatrist Gerald Post and Bandy Lee. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressShow.com. Well, that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Stanley Greenberg, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.